Right. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And and uh, uh, um, I, I shouldn't thank the uh, organizer because I invited myself. <laughs> so so, but I would like to take this chance to thank uh, all the people that actually contribute to this seminar, and especially for those who actually provide money for for inviting people to Princeton. So unfortunately, none of them is here today. <laughs> So anyway, so this is a joint work with Chris Woodward, who is also in audience. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's to use some uh, gauge theoretic construction to study Lagrangian flow theory. And so to begin, I will, I will first prepare to state the main theorem without um, many uh, technical uh, uh, details, which I will explain in a moment. So. So, so suppose we have a symplectic, like compact symplectic manifold, and we have a Lagrangian submanifold. So we can, to this uh, objects, we can associate a, a infinity algebra. Um, called the Fukaya algebra of this Lagrangian submanifold. So this is an algebraic object defined over some chain group with a sequence of multilinear maps called the composition maps. And this chain group is defined over a coefficient field called a Novikov field. where we take rational coefficients. So there, inside this field, there are two subrings. The subring of a series of non-negative exponents and a subring of positive coefficients, uh, positive exponents. So, so, so this has a, has a, has a has a has a family of deformations called the bulk deformations. So, so for any uh, cohomology class of this symplectic manifold with uh, lambda positive uh, coefficients, or rather, we should pick a, a cycle that represents uh, this class. We can we can define a similar a, a family of a infinity algebras. In principle, can be defined over the same chain group CF. Well, the composition maps are actually defined by counting uh, holomorphic disks with uh, interior constraints. So this gives you a family of A infinity algebra structures over the same uh, chain group. And a, so let's assume that we can put, uh, we, can, we can make all this A infinity algebra strict unital, which um, you know, the meaning will be explained in a, in a, in a, in a after, after I present this um, uh, introductory part. So, um, so they can be. So called strict unital. Right. <coughs> so anyway, this is this is the uh, starting point, I mean the the basic concept of A infinity algebra. So so now let's consider a special case um, that is assume the symplectic manifold is a GIT quotient. So here, G is a reductive Lie group with maximal compact subgroup K, and X tilde is K. -lan. Right. 
So any, for any Lagrangian inside, inside this um, GIT quotient, there is a way to lift this Lagrangian upstairs. which is is a k invariant lagrangian submanifold so actually using this this construction we can we can define an alternate a infinity algebra structure over the same chain group so this is due to chris So this is called a quasi map. A infinity algebra is is some kind of equivalent version of this. So it's denoted as f u k upper k. So this is defined over the same chain group. You know the same chain group downstairs of the of the Lagrangian downstairs, and the composition maps are different. It's counting some equivalent um, holomorph. I mean, counting some equivalent objects. So, so this can also be uh, strict unital. Anyway, those notions we'll be expl explaining in more details um, um, in the in the second half. Okay. So the main theorem reads as follows. So there exist in this case. Um, there exist a class C in the cohomology of the uh, quotient, which is independent of the Lagrangian. And, and a unital. A infinity morphism from the equivalent uh, A infinity algebra upstairs to the bulk that formed A infinity algebra downstairs. So, so this this morphism is, is the so-called open quantum current map because it's in, in, in some sense it's very it's closely related to the uh, classical um, current map, which is from the equivalent cohomology upstairs to the uh, you know cohomology of the uh, GIT quotient. All right. So I feel, uh, before before I talk about the uh, application of this, let me uh, let me uh, say a few remarks. <coughs> so this phi is defined over um, so phi is defined by counting vortices, which I'm going to explain uh, later. Well, uh, there is an alternate approach which can prove similar results by Fukaya. Using uh, quilts, and there is, a, there is a, a canonical Lagrangian correspondence between upstairs and downstairs. via this GIT quotient. <coughs> and 
And so a feature of our work is that there is no virtual technique uh, required. And instead, we will use the, the uh, method of Chiliback Monk. Um, So we need to put a few um, um, conditions in order to make use of this method. Um, so first, we need the rationality, of course. We need some kind of equivalent for this pair upstairs. So in particular, uh, I won't explain in, in, in many details, but uh, in, in particular, uh, it, it means, um, it implies that downstairs, downstairs object, um, the x, the, the sympathetic manifold x is, is, is rational, and there exists a, a, a holomorphic uh, divisor, which is dual to a multiple of the sympathetic class that is joined from the Lagrangian downstairs and such that the Lagrangian is exact in the divisor complement. And also to simplify our uh, argument, we assume this is not a very serious uh, restriction. I mean, not, not a very um, you know, important, um, how to say, important restriction. So we assume x tilde upstairs is either aspherical or monotone in, in the Euro sense. With, uh, in the monotone case, we assume this minimal trend number is at least two. So it's like either Euclidean space, for example, in the spherical case, or projective space in the, in the monotone case. And the third is that we assume the unstable locus of this action upstairs has complex co-dimension at least two. So this is our uh, assumption, basically. Um, and of course, you may wonder if we can extend to categories. Yes. Uh, in principle, we, we could do that. But we haven't done that. So extendable to A infinity categories. So, so what we have done is just for single Lagrangian and the uh, anamorphism algebra of that object. Any questions? Is there a matching between domain bounty form with target bounty form? Um, you mean the, the this guy is also using some bulk yes. deformation? Yes, that, that's something you can do, yes. Um, if I have time, I will, spend, I will say a little bit on that. Um, all right. So, yeah. Uh, is CF of L? Yeah. It's still the same. They are over this. Both these two a infinite algebras are defined over the same chain group. Okay. All right. So, so now let's talk about the application. So, so before saying about the, anything about the application, let's recall a few uh, uh, concepts, um, algebraic concepts. So recall for an a infinity algebra. with strict unit, the um, weak moral Cartan equation so let's let's ignore the convergence issue here. <laughs> 
So let's assume it's an infinite algebra over this Novikov ring, and and uh, and B is the element of A. So it, it's like it's like a projective flat connection equation. It, it B is like some some kind of complex gauge transformation or a choice of metric that makes the curvature equal to a multiple of the uh, central element of your um, you know the algebra, right? So yeah, I, I ignore the convergence issue in this in this part. Okay, so so the solution space. MC of A, all the space of weakly bounding cochains. Um, so if this is non-empty, we call this weakly unobstructed. And we know that if we pick any weakly bounding cochain from here, we can define a, a chain complex. And this is one way to define floral homology. So there is a notion of potential function. That is W defined over the space of weakly bounding cochains to this coefficient field by just taking this coefficient of E. Mm. Well, and there's very, uh, there are two very uh, um, simple algebraic implication. Two facts. So if if phi is a unital infinity morphism between two a infinity algebras over the same uh, coefficient field, then phi induces a map phi tuta between the space of weakly bounding cochains and also there is a commutative diagram In this way, basically, this this map between the space of weakly bounding cochains intertwines this um, these two potential functions of these two a infinity algebras. So, so why 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 this is useful? So, basically, if you apply this fact to this situation, then that that basically tells you that to 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 prove, for example, to prove that. The target a infinity algebra, or the or the object downstairs, is weakly unobstructed. You just need to verify that for the upstairs object, and actually, it is usually very hard to prove an actual a infinity algebra of a Lagrangian manifold inside compact symplectic manifold uh, is weakly unobstructed, unless you're in the in the monotone case. And actually, as as shown in the in the work of Chris. So the upstairs object, for example, if you're working in a, in, a, in a Euclidean space, it's very easy. It's, it's relatively easier to compute the uh, infinity algebra upstairs and to verify that upstairs object is is uh, weakly unobstructed. And by applying this um, result, that automatically implies that the Lagrange, you know, downstairs object is is weakly unobstructed. And also, this diagram is, is also useful. Um, and it's, it's better to be uh, explained with the, with the main example um, of this, of this um, um, project. So the main example is the, is the toric situation. So let's assume the downstairs object is a compact toric manifold.
and it has a molen polytope. <coughs> and if this polytope has n faces, then we can write x as a GIT quotient of this capital N dimensional um, complex vector space. by a linear action by some torus. And in this case, the rationality is very simple. Rationality just means the vertices of the moment polytopes are rational points in the, in the Euclidean space. And, and you can pick um, any point, like say um, tau in the interior of the moment polytope. The interior of the moment polytope gives you a Lagrangian torus sitting over this point, and the rationality just means that you're taking a rational point here. All right. So, so in this case, uh, this is also the motivating example uh, that, that motivates our, our project. So we would like to recall a few people's work. Um, so first, Fukai, Oot, and Ono, they showed that um, this, you know, the, the, the A infinity algebra downstairs is weakly unobstructed. And actually, it's weakly unobstructed for any um, bulk deformation. I mean, I mean they, they restrict some kind of bulk classes you can take, but let's just say it's, it's weakly unobstructed for a class of bulk deformations. And in particular, you, you know, using some notion called a canonical model, in, in some sense, the, the first cohomology, h upper one of L, is contained in the uh, space of weakly bounding cochains. Let me continue here. And there's also the work of Cho and O, oh, and also of Kaya O, Oten Ono. They showed that, they, can, they actually showed that the potential function uh, let's say without bulk, restricted to this subset H upper one, is equal to a um, the so-called given to Hori Wafa potential composed with some abstract coordinate change. And actually this guy, the restriction of the potential function to this H, H upper one is, 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 is a way to, to, to construct the uh, landau ginzburg mirror of this uh, toric manifold. Um, and the, their, their proof of the existence of such a coordinate change is, is rather abstract. It's based, based on the property of this function. Um, it's not uh, having any uh, geometric meaning in, in that work. And, and in, a, in, a, in, a, in a different work by Chen, Lao, Long, and Tsung, and also uh, Gonzalez Iritani. In the so-called, um, for semi-funnel um, toric manifold, they actually give a more um, explicit formula for this coordinate change.
And that formula shows that quantity change has some enumerative meaning. And, and on the other hand, it's more or less known to physicists that this, there, there is some, some kind of mirror map that intertwines these two um, potential functions. So, so this, um, so, so, so another work that's, that need to be mentioned is the work of Chris, who actually showed that um, the, uh, for general toric manifold, this, uh, the lifting of this, uh, you know, the equivalent theory is, is weakly unobstructed. H upper one is contained in MC. And the equivalent, you know, the, the potential function upstairs restricted to this H upper one is exactly the uh, given to Horivata potential. So, so basically, uh, the given to Horivata potential is like, y y if you look at this um, moment polytope, if it has three phases, then basically upstairs there are three disk classes. And this potential just calculate, just, just count this contribution of this basic disk classes. However, if you do it downstairs, for, for a general toric manifold, there might be, um, you know, configurations like this where this disk is obstructed, has negative or zero, uh, uh, you know, churn numbers which still contribute to this potential function. So, 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 so this, this guy doesn't exist upstairs. So basically there is some, some discrepancy of between this uh, more combinatorial defined given the whole Vata potential and actual Lagrangian flow potential. So, so our work is just trying to, exp just trying to understand the, the relation, especially um, this, uh, how, how we can explain that there exists something like quantity change between these two um, potential functions. And if you look at uh, this diagram, it basically shows that this A infinity morphism defines a kind of coordinate change. And so that's, that's a kind of, you know, like a boundary coordinate change. And also this uh, bulk class C is the, you know, in, in some sense, the interior coordinate change. So this class C will basically change this uh, formal variable Q in this uh, Novikov ring and this this boundary quantity change basically is, a, is some kind of map from H1 to H1. And in this se semi-final case, what they showed is essentially that uh, there is only the um, interior quantity change. There will be a class C in the semi-final case, while the boundary quantity change is kind of trivial in the, in the, in the semi-final case. All right. So this is basically the um, the um, the idea, the, the the main motivation and the uh, main result of our project. Um, so far, we have something more to do. Okay. So now let's talk about the more detailed constructions. So basically, I will explain what is the um, so the second I will explain what is actually what are those objects okay so to construct an infinity algebra of Lagrangian we use the merse spot approach so choose a Morse function and we assume L is a connected Lagrangian so it, you can make this Morse function to have a unique maximal point, a uh, local maximal called XM and you define this chain group to 
to be the lambda vector space generated by all critical points. And there has some grading, but I want to ignore the grading uh, today. So then, for example, you can use counting grading lines to define uh, the so-called Morse-Mill-Witten complex, which computes the cohomology of the Lagrangian. And the way to define the infinity algebra is to use holomorphic disks. So you choose a compatible J on the uh, symplectic manifold. And then for certain uh, topological data, a collection of critical points um, and the homology class, you can consider the moduli space of the so-called treed holomorphic disks. satisfying some conditions. So basically, this is a combinatorial, you know, this is a configuration that modeled on, on, a, on, a, on a tree. So you have a one output and the several inputs. So the inputs are labeled by the critical points in, in a counterclockwise way. And the output is labeled by another critical point. And they are, they are connected in a, in a, in a way by, via a holomorphic disks. So those uh, black, I would call black disks, are holomorphic disks. Um, with boundary on this Lagrangian L. And the conditions are, you know, basically you have to uh, have this uh, asymptotic, asymptotic constraint given by those uh, critical points. So the inputs and the outputs are actually gradient lines defined over half length. So inputs are over minus infinity to 0, and output is defined from 0 to plus infinity. So you can label the asymptotic constraint by critical points. And the sum of classes of the disks is equal to your given class B and the stability condition. So basically it says if you have a constant disk, then it has at least three uh, markings on the boundary. And you modulo uh, reparameterization. So this is the uh, not yet compactified moduli space. So you have a usual way to compactify this moduli space, where co-dimension 1 um, stratum corresponds to bubbling disks or breaking trajectories, or a, a, traject a finite trajectory shrink to 0. And the co-dimension 2, um, you know, co-dimension 2 uh, degeneration corresponds, for example, to uh, bubbling of holomorphic spheres. So, but anyway, in principle, you can count the zero-dimensional moduli spaces you know, by perturbing all the data, you know, the Morse function, the uh, complex structure J, in the fashion that the perturbation depends on the location on this uh, domain object. You can make all relevant moduli spaces um, transverse then um, we can count so if, if the dimension is not zero you just define the counting to be zero so you count this number of solutions in this moduli space and you weight it by this formal variable so this gives you an element of lambda And you can define the multilinear maps by these countings. So you just need to define over generators And then extend in, in uh, by the by the rule of multilinear maps. So then, so 
there's an infinity algebra with you know strict unit given by this maximal critical point and uh, actually there is a way to make this work rigorously so the the the, the perspective we take is is the the um, is from the work of Sharist and Woodward. For all the rational case using the Chilibak monk um, approach. So for rational situation, you can really make this work. You construct a, a infinity algebra associated to this uh, Lagrangian sum manifold. So then if you have a if you have a, a homology class Or rather, you, you, you really pick a cycle, or at least a pseudo cycle, representing this class. Mm. You can define the bulk deformed uh, A infinity compositions just by considering same types of objects, but allow interior constraints that you require the, um, the evaluation of the disks at those interior markings to pass through that cycle, or the pseudo cycle. So in this way, you can, you can define the bulk deformed uh, infinity algebra, which is over the same chain group. So this gives you All right. Can I ask, yeah. Is this bubbling kind of interior or Yeah, it's interior though. So the so so that's a good question. So so basically the the real boundary of all the moduli spaces is caused by breaking some trajectory. So the broken one are, you know, exactly contributes to the terms appear in the A-infinity relation. So, so if you have disk bubbling, so this is really the boundary of two different moduli spaces. So you can, you can really make this an interior point. So this, this can be the degeneration of this by shrinking this length. Or it can be the degeneration of a, a single disk where you might have bubbling to split off, the, to split into two pieces. So this is really the, if you, if you union these two moduli spaces, this is the interior point. So this doesn't, doesn't really enter the um, expression of A-infinity relation. So the way to prove A-infinity relations is you know, the same as the pr constructing the Morse complex by, by looking at the boundary of one-dimensional moduli spaces, all right. OK, so now let's look at um, the uh, upstairs object. So recall that x is the GIT quotient. So, so this action has a linearization, which gives you a moment map It's actually, you know, in, in principle, this, this should work for, for just a complex ma symplectic manifold acted by compact D group in a Hamiltonian fashion. However, we just restrict to the GIT case. So there is a moment map for this K action. <laughs> whose value is the Lie algebra of the um, compact D group. So we always identify the dual and its itself by choosing some, some metric. Right. So, so then by Kempf-Ness, the GIT quotient coincides with the symplectic quotient. And 
the k action on this level set of movement map is free, then you know the pre-image of this projection of this Lagrangian will be a the union of k orbits will be a k-invariant Lagrangian. inside this level set of moment map as a Lagrangian of the total space x tilde. Then you choose the same uh, Morse function f on the downstairs Lagrangian, and you define the same chain group. Well, you, you, you count different type of disks. You choose a k-invariant j k invert almost complex structure on X. And what you count is configurations <coughs> which I use the, the white disks to represent a a K orbit of J tilde holomorphic disk upstairs. So because the equation is K invariant, we can take the moduli space of J tilde holomorphic disks and mod out by the K action. Because the K action on Lagrangian is free, so the action on the moduli space is also free. And then the, the matching condition is then uh, obvious. So, so, so the gradient line is downstairs, so the evaluation at this point is inside this Lagrangian. And the boundary evaluation of holomorphic disk after molding out by k is also a point in the Lagrangian downstairs. So, so then by counting, uh, basically counting zero-dimensional moduli spaces of this with different types of disks, we can define the quasi-map uh, A infinity uh, algebra. And indeed, they are counting different things. So let me let me give an example of of the difference of uh, of disks. So for example, so if we have P one, which is C two mod C star, and you can consider upstairs the map. L tilde is S1 cross S1 in C star. So this Lagrangian projects down to the to the to the equator of P1. But actually this, this holomorphic disk upstairs doesn't project down to holomorphic disk downstairs because if z is equal to alpha, this gives you zero zero. And thus that that actually means you have some holomorphic disk upstairs which passes through the unstable locus of this action. So those disks cannot be projected down to the quotient. And that's some kind of quasi-map means that this is not really a map into the quotient. It's like a map mod, you know, away from some, some isolated points. So, so basically, this object you know, um, contain different sets of disks. So, so a priori, this gives you a different infinity structure. All right. Okay, now let's let's see how we construct this uh, uh, morphism between these two uh, algebraic structures. So this is defined by by counting uh, vortices over so-called affine vortices or, or point-like instantons in in the gauged sigma model. So let's first introduce them. Vortex equation, and we only consider the case that the domain is either the complex plane or the upper half plane. So an affine vortex over this domain is a map
from this domain to x tilde cross k cross k, the Lie algebras, solving a partial differential equation, and the boundary condition. So the boundary value of u is contained in the Lagrangian upstairs. So this is the vortex equation. And, uh, and, and in, in physics terminology, you can call u a, a matter field, and the phi and the per se are, are the two components of the gauge field. So phi and per se can be viewed as the two components, ds and dt component of a connection. And the first equation basically says that this map u is holomorphic, but it's not holomorphic with respect to the trivial connection, but it's holomorphic re with respect to the, to the twisted, you know, the, the non-trivial connection given by these two components, phi and psi. So here, x sub phi and x sub psi are the uh, infinitesimal actions. <coughs> and the second equation, so this term is actually the, the curvature of this connection. So a few features about this equation. So first, this is gauge invariant. So, so for any gauge transformation defined over this domain, this, trans this will transform a u phi psi to another object. But if, if one satisfies the equation, the other also satisfies. And This is also translation invariant. So, so on either a complex plane or the upper half plane, there is a translation of the domain. So this equation is invariant under those translations. So this is really a, in, in, an important uh, difference from holomorphic curves. So for hol holomorphic curves, this is uh, conformal invariant. But this equation is only translation invariant. And you have the asymptotic behavior of these solutions at infinity. Because this is over the non-compact domain, you should really care about that. So this is, this is proved by um, Gail Solomon, Ziotina, for the closed case, and Wang and myself for the open case. So basically, that says there exists a well-defined evaluation in x or in the Lagrangian um, at infinity. So although these fields are taking values upstairs, but the evaluation at infinity is only well-defined as a point downstairs. And this actually shows that um, the solution is actually close up at infinity. So you can use, you can, you can, so any solution actually represents some homology class. Um, so in the closed case, it represents a equivalent homology class upstairs. And in the open case, it represents a relative both integer coefficients, relative homology class, uh, equivalent homology class. All right. So, so the, the most important uh, you know, story about this uh, vortex equation is, is how we compactify the moduli space.
so basically, this is better to be explained in terms of energy. So, so suppose we are in the in the in the in the in the closed case. So, so basically, the energy should decay at infinity. Inside, so the energy distribution looks like this. Suppose you have a sequence of object which has uniformly bounded total energy, but in the sequence, the energy distribution may behave differently. So, so first, it may behave like, you know. At at the infinitesimal level, it has a concentration of energy. So this corresponds bubbling of spheres upstairs, or you know the energy may split up into different areas, like this, or it can like the certain amount of energy can just go to infinity like uniformly. It doesn't you know uh, it's like over a very large scale that. That has some some that supports some energy, um, like it goes uh, flat and flat. You know, the the you know the energy is l looks like um, the absolute value of energy like actually goes to zero, but the total amount of energy still uh, preserves. So these three situations uh, actually tells you that the. Uh, the stable objects you want to put to compactify the moduli space of vortices is more complicated. It's, it's like a scaled object consisting of um, components in different scales. So this is the compactness, compactness theorem proved by um, Zutina in a closed case, and Wang and myself proving the open case. That basically shows if you have a sequence of affine vortices with uniformly bounded energy, and then there exists a subsequence which converge uh, modulo gauge transformation to a stable object, and I will just explain in terms, you know, by drawing a picture, and I will only explain in, in, in the open case. So I will use This guy to denote a, a copy of upper half plane. So this is the way to draw a quilt, quilted object, but this is combinatorially is similar to, to vortices. So so this is like a upper half plane, a copy of upper half plane, but it's close up in infinity. So suppose you have a sequence of such thing, it will converge to a something with multiple components. And the typical situ typical one looks like So, so what what do I mean by this? So, so this is this this object. So, so there are two three types of components in this picture. So there are completely white components. So those components are holomorphic spheres or disks upstairs. So that's caused by energy concentration in very small scale. And there are also completely black regions, black components, that are uh, holomorphic spheres or disks downstairs. That's caused by this type of energy, you know, behavior, and those are there are also the half white, half black objects, so which are affine vortices over the upper half plane, or the affine vortices over the complex plane, and the boundary values are given by this Lagrangian sum manifold, either upstairs or downstairs. So, or in other words, the vortex, vortex equation is something, some equation that interpolates between, you know, interpolates holomorphic curves upstairs and holomorphic curves downstairs. So, one important feature is about the co-dimension one degeneration. So, for for sequence of vortex equation vortex in, in over the upper half plane, the co-dimension one degeneration. There are two types. <laughs> so
so you know a sequence of alpha and vortex over hyperplane can can develop a, a disk bubble upstairs. And the other one is it can it can degenerate in the following way. So, so a co-dimension one a degeneration of alpha and vortices can actually have arbitrary number of components. This is basically because this is not conformal invariant. It's different from homomorphic curve case. It's only translation invariant. So actually, this degeneration is only co-dimension one, although you have you know, more than two components. So basically, by oops, then we can define some kind of treat object to define this uh, infinite morphism. So let's treat scaled vortex over upper half plane looks like. Sorry. So you just, all these boundary nodes are replaced by certain uh, gradient segments. And so this is the moduli space you would like to consider. And just by uh, perturbing the perturbation data, J and uh, F, you can make all such kind of moduli spaces transverse. And by counting, so, so you know, you can, you can use a homology class from this to, to actually label all these components. So this is the common space of all homology classes, either upstairs or downstairs. So, so you can consider moduli spaces, which can be denoted as this. And by counting zero-dimensional moduli space, this defines a sequence of multilinear maps, k linear maps, and the infinity relation for this uh, morphism, this collection of uh, multilinear maps, can be checked by just looking at the. Uh, boundary of one-dimensional moduli spaces. So, so there is one important condition due to the symmetry of vortices. There's a called a balance condition. So in this picture, we should require that these two lengths should be equal. And this is bigger than this length. So this is some condition required from the symmetry. So, so the boundary of one-dimensional moduli space could have, you know, could break here. That corresponds to one part, one side of the A infinity relation, and or it could break at here, actually simultaneously. So that is the other part of the A infinity relation for multilinear maps. And lastly, let me explain the class C. What is class C here? So actually, in this picture, the downstairs object that defines the bulk deform in infinity algebra is, is is like this. We don't we we actually use this moduli space to define the the downstairs object, 
and it, it looks like I put some interior constraint and ask the evaluation of disks to pass through the, 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 the cycle that is described by this uh, affine vortices over the complex plane. So, so basically, can, we can We can consider this modulized space of alpha and vortices over complex plane representing a class. And this has an evaluation map to the uh, quotient. And the point is, this is a pseudo cycle. And the class C is defined by summing over all such um, you know, instanton contributions the Pancredu of the evaluation of this modulized spaces at infinity and weighted by this uh, so-called equivalent symplectic area. So in this sense, the, the downstairs object is, is like you use some kind of pseudo cycle to, to, to label the interior constraints. And that's why this class C appears without, I mean, there, there should be some correction appears downstairs that actually makes the, the, um, the, the multi-linear maps an infinity morphism. So I think I should stop here. <laughs>